Hello and welcome to the 2021 Watershed Congress. Today is Thursday, day four of our virtual Watershed Congress week. We're happy that you're joining us today. The Watershed Congress is organized by the Delaware Riverkeeper Network in collaboration with many other organizations. My name is Emma Brady and I'm the Administrative Coordinator at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. I'm also your moderator for this session, 10 Years of Green City, Clean Waters, a 25-year plan for stormwater. We're pleased to present our speakers for this session. Glenn Abrams, the Deputy Commissioner of Communications and Engagement, leading the Public Affairs Division at the Philadelphia Water Department. And Mark Camerata, the Deputy Water Commissioner for Planning and Environmental Services for the Philadelphia Water Department. Now I'm going to turn it over to Mark to begin. Well, thank you so much, Emma. Let me bring up my screen here. A uh, big thank you to all. Um, the Watershed Congress organizers and all the partners. Uh, thank you to the Delaware River Riverkeeper Network for allowing us to share this message today and uh, hopefully take part in a, in a good Q&A session at the end of our slide deck here. Um, so as Emma mentioned, uh, Glenn and I have the privilege today to be able to represent the Philadelphia Water Department and sharing uh, probably what was 10 years of, of lead up into Green City Clean Waters and 10 years of implementation for, for Green City Clean Waters, which really is our 25 year plan for uh, investing in infrastructure to mitigate the effects of combined sewer overflow. And hopefully at the end of this slide deck, you'll see uh, quite a bit more. Um, proud to share the stage, uh, virtual stage today with Glenn as well, just some of our headshots here. Uh, I look prettier in person, so, so don't judge. Um, but let's uh, let's get right into it here. So um, a lot of times, you know, folks will kind of give an intro into into their water utility, their organization, and they'll give you, uh, you know, statistics on pipes and treatment plants and you know all the things and you know geography of you know where we are and who we serve. And I like to start the presentation more with uh, you know kind of our mission statement. Um, yes, the Philadelphia Water Department uh, provides uh, utility based services. Uh, we provide drinking water, we manage wastewater, and 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 uh, you know, collect and treat stormwater effectively. But it's the second part of our statement I really like to focus on that gives a glimpse into who we are, uh, what we do, and hopefully uh, gives you a glimpse into, into how and, and why we do what we do. Um, really focusing on the customer focus piece, equity, cost effectiveness, getting the public involved, knowing that the water department is an economic kind of uh, 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 engine uh, for greater Philadelphia in, in the services we provide, and really most importantly, uh, uh, as important is uh, our ethic about environmental stewardship. And, and hopefully that sets the tone for what you see on this slide deck. Um, as a, uh, a, a one water utility with the responsibility of drinking water, stormwater, wastewater, you, you can imagine we have a lot of responsibilities, uh, permit responsibilities, combined sewer overflow management, uh, stormwater management, and, and uh, you know, the, the separate sewer areas of our city, uh, responsibilities for uh, ecological uplift and stream and habitat wet restoration, uh, protecting the drinking water supply for you know two million people in this region uh, when we really only have a, a one or two percent jurisdictional you know uh, 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 boundary on the actual uh, watershed. Um, always doing it with stakeholder goals in mind and always thinking about the future. You know what's next? Uh, emerging contaminants, uh, a changing climate, uh, increasing flooding, um, a lot of things. Uh, which is why we kind of focus on integrated watershed management planning. Why we think about long term why we think about the people we serve and how we do business, not just now, but well into the future. Um, when we were required to update our long-term control plan, our combined sewer overflow um, program, we looked at what it is we were trying to, to accomplish, and that's bringing about uh, benefits to our receiving streams, improving water quality. But when you look at the, the, the streams that, that we're trying to protect, uh, in an urban corridor, you see a lot of, uh, unfortunately, the stuff on the right here. Um, you see lack of channel habitat and diversity, wetland degradation, poor access to streams, you know, vandalism, dumping and trash, in addition to just water quality related issues. So when we're recasting a, a long-term control plan to mitigate the effects of, of combined sewer overflow, think about stormwater management, uh, you know, holistically, um, we really started thinking, well, what were the other goals that the city was embarking on? What were our goals as a water department in addition to water quality improvements? And it started to lay out some ideas of, of trying to think about this from a multi-benefit approach, thinking about you know, resiliency, uh, open space, livability, uh, the local economy, urban revitalization, clearly enhancing our, our, our very impressive infrastructure network, uh, trying to advance sustainability goals. So 
he's really factored into how we wanted to build uh, a 25 year long term control plan investment, you know, moving forward. Um, we are responsible for Clean Water Act and Safe Drinking Water Act requirements, of course, that's the fishable, swimmable, drinkable side of things. Um, but as you can see from our mission statement and our desire to bring about multiple benefits, I really want to focus on those other words here, attractive, accessible, just, and affordable. And that was really the foundation of how we wanted to cast our Green City Clean Waters plan. It is a, a, a compliance program, though. So I immediately kind of talk about our goals and our, our, our wants and turn it into, well, what were our targets? And I'm going to leave out for the sake of time the years and years of planning that went into kind of building a, a long-term compliance program um, and kind of just talk about well, what it is we were required to, to deliver. Uh, we worked with our state agencies. We worked with EPA uh, to put together a 25-year, multi-billion dollar plan to mitigate the effects of combined sewer overflows. And these were kind of the terms, investment and treatment plan upgrades, looking at major collector system uh, optimization and, and, and rehabs. Um, and really trying to reduce uh, um, pollutants of concern associated with combined sewer overflows. Uh, it was reducing fecal coliform, looking at uh, total suspended solids, trying to increase DO in our receiving streams. Um, and one of the elements which we're gonna focus quite a bit on today is, is green acres. And that's really uh, kind of the term we wanted to do is talk about 10 years of implementing sustainable infrastructure. But you can implement sustainable nature-based design like green infrastructure without having a solid foundation of, of your traditional infrastructure network. Um, a lot of times our program is, you know, people think, oh, it's just about the green, it's just about the green. Um, I wanna highlight, you know, very briefly, the substantial investments we're making, not just in our treatment plants, but in our collection system as well. Um, some of you may have seen in, in, in the news not too long ago, uh, a, a, a loan coming from our state revolving fund, PennVest, uh, over $100 million for, for a treatment plant upgrade at one of our, North, at our Northeast facility. Um, we're making significant wet weather capacity investments uh, at a couple of our treatment plants um, and making them a little more resilient uh, so we can operate them during periods of high flow uh, more often and more frequent. Um, we're, we have an, a, a, a wet weather treatment capacity of 1.4 billion gallons per day uh, after these projects are implemented. So significant enhancements to our treatment plants. Um, we're also looking at capacity and flow delivery optimization and upgrades. Um, kind of a boring slide, but very important to kind of look at your existing system and see how you can really uh, uh, update and enhance very critical locations uh, in, in, the, in the skeleton, in that backbone of, of your system. Um, so just a kind of a list of some interceptor rehabilitation and chamber modifications, looking at hydraulic restrictions, uh, you know, increasing pumping, uh, working on transmission capacity, in-system storage and treatment. It's a lot of other traditional elements that really uh, allow us to collect and deliver and treat uh, more wet weather flow at our treatment plants. So what I'm going to focus on really, Glenn and I are focus on for the rest of this presentation is really that, that visionary and ambitious element that started to think about non-traditional infrastructure as a way to, to manage stormwater uh, at the source where it falls. And this is this green acre requirement. You can see from the bar at the bottom, uh, required to implement in kind of five-year chunks uh, with the delivery of, of these assets uh, increasing uh, as the years go on. Um, as Emma mentioned, our subject of our, our presentation is 10 years of implementation. So we're gonna give you a glimpse in, into those 10 years. So let me start by, by kind of defining what green stormwater infrastructure is and what nature-based design is. And I wanted to highlight these words here, interception, infiltration, evaporation and transpiration, storage, slow release, reuse, uh, and give a little glimpse into some of the photos of what actually constitutes green infrastructure. Um, green infrastructure is really managing water at the source. It's defined as a way to manage the, the volume or the, the rainfall that falls on, a, on impervious cover uh, by using uh, some kind of system that, that takes into account those premises up top, interception, infiltration, evaporation. And the idea is to kind of manage water at the source, preventing it from getting into our sewers, uh, which will be capacity limited uh, during periods of extreme wet weather like, like we're seeing today, like some of you may be seeing right now. Um, so it's very ambitious to think about delivering 10,000 you know, green acres. And let me actually just define green acres a little bit too. It's actually a measurement of volume. Even though it's called a green acre, it makes you think it's an area calculation. Really what it is, it's managing 1.5 inches of runoff from every directly connected impervious area to the city. So I use an example of maybe a, uh, a parking lot um, that could be one acre in size, but we build a green bioswale that's only maybe a tenth of an acre in, in physical footprint. If we managed an inch and a half of runoff from that hardscape in the bioswale, 
we actually call that a, 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 you know 1.5 green acres, even though only a sliver of it is green. So it's really kind of a, a calculation uh, that we use to kind of measure uh, you know volume managed using sustainable practices. So how do we deliver 10,000 acres? So I'm getting ahead of myself here. Well, we looked at it from kind of three different delivery approaches. We wanted to establish way early in the early, you know, in the program, not to allow folks uh, to, to design and build in a way that actually exacerbated our, our urban runoff concerns. So we instituted stormwater regulations that really uh, um, allowed us to kind of prevent development in our city, which we all want, to not have uh, deleterious effects on, on our water environment. The second phase was kind of incentivizing retrofit. So how do you take the built environment, projects that are already, I mean, buildings and, and, and impervious cover that's already there, and how do you incentivize a retrofit? How do you get someone to kind of redesign and reconstruct that area so you lessen the effects of that built environment? And the third arm of our delivery approach are public retrofits, direct investment using ratepayer dollars into public spaces like green streets, parks, and facilities. So the combination of these three tools has set us on a path to implementing green infrastructure at scale. So I'm going to go into some of these in detail. Um, the stormwater regulations, uh, basically any earth disturbance in Philadelphia, over 15,000 square feet, must manage stormwater on site. Uh, we regulate the management of stormwater. Um, there's technical requirements to think about water quality, uh, rate control and treatment, uh, and also look at ways for flood protection and channel protection as well. Um, so a major tool, again, for any new development in our city that hits that earth disturbance threshold to actually design and construct sustainably so we, we actually manage stormwater in an appropriate way. Um, here's some photos you can see incorporated into residential design, uh, into you know, academic uh, institutions, um, commercial corridors. So lots of kind of you know, amazing sustainable practices incorporated into the urban fabric through the development process. Um, we don't just kind of have people build it and just make sure it's built you know, correctly and walk away from it. We also know that this is an asset we need for long-term uh, uh, compliance. Um, so we have every practice that's built uh, uh, you know, an operations and maintenance agreement uh, that's kind of connected to the deed. Uh, so folks know when you build this site that it's something to operate and maintain well into the future. We also make sure it's done right uh, through construction inspections, through project closeouts and, and maintenance inspections to make sure everything is being uh, built correctly, being maintained correctly. So this can be an asset that we rely on and functions uh, for the good of the environment well into the future. Um, we do this by working very closely with the development community. This is a, a symbiotic uh, public-private partnership here. Uh, you can inject yourself into the city uh, development process uh, and clog it up, that's for sure. So everything we do in the regulatory world with development community is kind of hand in hand. Uh, making sure that we're we're you know soliciting feedback uh, before we implement any changes to to our terms. So very healthy environment with the development community, and and that benefits not just us but it benefits that community as well. So we can do things where we can expedite reviews uh, that use more sustainable practices, and we can come up with some creative ideas that allow for density bonuses uh, when developers use uh, green roofs. So these kind of creative ideas get, get spurned out of a, a healthy kind of dialogue and relationship with the community. The second delivery arm, incentivized retrofits, really started from a parcel-based calculation. Um, you can imagine that, that you should probably, you know, have a stormwater uh, rate structure that, that really reflects the stormwater you generate on site. Um, well, it turns out we didn't have the ability to do that, you know, a decade or so ago. Uh, we didn't have the technology to really assess on a parcel-by-parcel -parcel basis. Uh, what your contribution to our system was. But through uh, technology and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, geographic information systems, we were able to kind of recalculate how we bill uh, for stormwater. And we really based your stormwater charge on your impervious cover and gross area, the size of your facility. Um, so what it did is it reallocated the way we build uh, for stormwater, uh, revenue neutral. All we did is just people who generated more stormwater paid more. Those who generated less paid less. Uh, and we saw kind of a shift in industrial, commercial, and large-scale residential properties uh, had a, an adjustment in how they bill. Um, what we also did is gave an incentive to folks and said, if you modify, if you reduce your gross area, which is sometimes hard to do, but if you mitigate the effects of the impervious area, um, then we actually would give you a fee reduction. Um, it actually wasn't necessarily enough to really stimulate these retrofits that we wanted. So we came in with a grant program and we actually started to give uh, uh, money out uh, through competitive grant process uh, for folks to go in and 
uh, retrofit their properties. Here's an example of, of Lee Elementary, um, where we gave a grant of a, a, about $150,000, uh, $300,000 um, to go in and retrofit the property. Uh, so the school district was a bit revitalized, but we have some stormwater management uh, you know, associated. We got two Green Acres out of the deal at a, at a pretty, uh, you know, pretty phenomenal unit cost for, for Green Acre management. Um, so you can see how the parcel charge uh, and associated with kind of the grant started to get uh, you know, folks to, to really retrofit these properties uh, in, in a sustainable fashion. Um, like the regulations, you don't just kind of encourage it and have people build it and walk away from it. We know it's a key program that we want to think about for a while. So we have a lot of web tools um, you know, that we use, Credit Explorer and Parcel Viewer, uh, to really kind of generate excitement and, and get out the tools uh, to let people know this is something they can and, 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 and should uh, consider moving forward. And you know, how you modify your property and how it relates to, to a fee reduction and, and uh, you know, what your options are out there. Um, so those two kind of private you know, delivery methods, uh, really, as you'll see later on in the slide deck, uh, are absolutely vital uh, to allowing us to, to deliver green infrastructure at scale. Um, but it goes beyond than just regulate and incentivize. You can see how engaging with the private community uh, um, really allows you to start thinking about other very important delivery methods. And these are all things that we've, we've, uh, you know, we've, we've used to some extent and are trying to think how we can increase these at scale. But you know, a lot of stuff like uh, offsite or nearsite mitigation, banking and trading, additional uh, height bonuses, uh, you know, oversizing public green infrastructure, allowing private connections, upsizing private infrastructure to, to, to send public right away runoff into these sites. Um, so just a lot of kind of creative uh, uh, public private uh, uh, tools to really, again, harness the power of the private community in, in helping us deliver infrastructure. Um, I'm going to focus on public funded projects now for, for the rest of the slide, and Glenn's going to take over in a few slides here, but just wanted to show uh, some signature pieces we have here. Uh, investing in street practices, uh, uh, vacant lands, um, you know, uh, uh, park, Fairmont Park and recreation facilities, schoolyards. Um, we're really going to kind of unpack a lot of the lessons learned and, and some of the things uh, uh, really that, that uh, the fruits of, of 10 years of implementation. Um, we're going to give a little glimpse into each of these elements, kind of the life cycle of, of green infrastructure and things we've learned throughout, how we do outreach, how we plan, how we design, you know, through construction, through operation and maintenance moving forward. Um, so I will hand it off to you now, Glenn. Great, thanks, Mark. And uh, all right, so such an important part of PWD's Green City Clean Waters program centers around education and outreach. And when we started this program 10 years ago, many people both inside and outside city government had no idea what green infrastructure or GSI for short, what, what it was. And as the program was developing, we spent a lot of time educating staff within PWD and other city departments about GSI, how it is designed, constructed, and maintained. Designing and constructing uh, demonstration projects, often in partnership with nonprofit organizations, was really critical to fostering an understanding and gaining support. As we move from program development into program implementation, we realized early on that it is critical that people that live, work, play near GSI are given opportunities to become informed and involved, and perhaps even be inspired by Green City Clean Waters. At the very least, we had to be prepared to answer why were we ripping up a community sidewalk. Within PWD's Public Affairs Division, we have a team of outreach and communication specialists that has developed a comprehensive GSI community notification and outreach workflow that involves checkpoints with stakeholders, residents, city council staff, and others throughout each phase of every project, from planning, design, and pre-construction to construction and maintenance. Over the years, we have worked with a variety of professionals to communicate messages through different vehicles to reach as many people as possible. We work with environmental educators, the media and reporters, artists, muralists, dancers, singers, and most recently, even a poet to communicate about GSI. We know that not everyone receives information in the same way. Uh, for instance, art may resonate with some people while others really need the data to understand. So we need to do our very best to explore every form of communication possible 
to reach our in intended audiences. Uh, next slide, please. Our engagement is not about one-way communication. Simply showing up to tell a community what is going to happen to them um, it is not enough. We approach community engagement through the lens of partnership. It is so important that we take the time to listen rather than just talk. We need to take the time to understand community priorities and how our projects might be able to address some of those priorities. Fostering two-way conversations can lead to strong relationship building and trust building. We know that without community support, we just can't get very far. We need the civic leaders, uh, the local shop owners, city council representatives, and every resident that lives on a block impacted by the construction of green infrastructure to be supporters and cheerleaders and really rally behind Green City Clean Waters. Without their support, we can't be successful in making these projects truly sustainable. Uh, public Affairs works closely with the department's planners, engineers, scientists, landscape architects, and others every day to ensure that we understand fully the ramifications of each project and that we have a good grasp of the technical information that we translate back to the community. And it is our role to receive community plan feedback on plans and designs and advocate on behalf of the community. Okay, next slide. So here are a few takeaways from our public engagement experience. One, building trust within teams is critical to success. This includes both internal teams and external partners. Uh, an important part of building trust is honesty and transparency. Clearly communicate what you can and cannot do. Two, anticipate potential conflicts and challenges before they arise. The sooner you can address a conflict, the better for moving a project forward. Third, use a variety of tools to communicate. Everyone learns and receives information in different, in, in different ways. And fourth, listen. Make sure communications are two-way. Sometimes it is important to spend most of your time listening rather than talking. Next slide. Um, all right. And <laughs> Trying to advance. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Before I move away from education and outreach, I just want to highlight that community engagement is one component of a comprehensive education program at PWD. From the Fairmount Waterworks Interpretive Center and our partnership with the School District of Philadelphia using our watershed curriculum to signage, tours, blogs, websites, storm drain marking, stewardship activities. We are working on creating many opportunities for Philadelphians to learn about and care for our shared water resources. Next slide. Now, I'd like to take a bit of time to talk about how we plan for green infrastructure. First, we focus on the street grid as our primary planning element. Next. Next, we need to understand parcel uses. What is residential versus commercial? parks versus schools, and institutional uses. Next slide. And then it is important to analyze ownership, uh, especially understanding public versus private ownership. As you see here, the overwhelming amount of ownership in the city is under private control. Next slide. And finally, we build partnerships. Partnerships include uh, across city departments and with institutions, such as School District of Philadelphia, or special improvement districts. Uh, next slide. And yes, um, for planning and community engagement, we utilize a district planning approach with the combined sewer service area divided into four districts. It is so important that we understand and consider site context. When we design GSI, it needs to fit into a neighborhood. And as I discussed earlier, address community priorities as much as possible. District planners and community engagement personnel are PWD's link to establishing strong partnerships with other city agencies, city council members and their staff, community-based organizations, businesses, property owners, and more. Our goal is to balance PWD's planning and infrastructure invest objectives with community needs as best as we can. Next slide. To be most successful, 
PWD cannot work alone. It is important to leverage investments through other programs and initiatives, such as the Rebuild program that is investing capital improvements in parks, recreation centers, and other city facilities throughout Philadelphia. We are also working closely with programs to increase tree canopy and reduce heat stress. And GSI can also have a role in the city's Vision Zero initiative, for instance, where cur curb bump outs and rain gardens can help reduce the length of a traffic crossing, enhancing pedestrian safety. Next slide. Our extensive planning work has accumulated in the green, <clears throat> excuse me, green stormwater infrastructure strategic implementation plan, which provides the roadmap for projects needed to achieve the goals outlined in the Green City Clean Waters Plan. The plan confirms that, 10, acre, that the 10,000 acre target is achievable, but there are action items that we need to address to make them all happen. Next slide. We have developed comprehensive checklists and guidance to consider project feasibility, accounting for a variety of community and site context. As um, for instance, uh, proximity to vacant land, uh, short uh, dumping and litter, um, the potential for community stewardship, and of course, um, the opportunity for collaboration with uh, various entities. And next slide. And I uh, believe I have the last two, right, Mark? Or are you taking over here? Yep, I'll take it from here. So. All right, perfect. Thank Glenn. you. Yeah, I think it's really important, um, you know, when you have a program that's investing in surface infrastructure, investing in our communities, how important it is to engage with the communities. So uh, really glad Glenn went into, into that level of detail. Um, we can't leverage our subsurface infrastructure uh, uh, without kind of investing in the surface and investing in the surface clearly is, is you know, connecting with our neighbors. Um, you know, these are, these are uh, you know, community practices that, that uh, you know that we want to succeed and it takes uh takes a lot of education and outreach to, to get people to understand what it is we're doing for the long term here um so moving into uh you know a lot of the other kind of life cycle pieces here and and uh kind of the lessons learned um i'm going to go through this stuff rather quickly and, and not too much detail but just really kind of give the highlights here um how important this kind of guidance and standardization is um when you're building uh nature-based distributed infrastructure of the type that you've seen some of these photos um, so what we do is knowing we want to do this for the, the next 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, um, really trying to standardize where we can. Um, it's really helpful to our professional services community, uh, designers, landscapers, uh, you know, architects, engineering firms, um, really trying to just put out planning guidelines and design resources you know, throughout, um, you know, covering just a variety of things, how we do process workflows to how we do you know, standard design details, uh, you know, how we uh, do survey and geotech work. All this is very helpful in building at scale. Um, moving into construction, um, you know, lessons learned in construction is uh, there are different elements in, in these practices. There's some structural elements, subsurface, and natural element surface. Uh, so we learned early on, you know, how we have to manage planting seasons and provisional maintenance and dealing with contractor warranties when, you know, months later we'd be vegetating and planting. Um, we learned to, to maybe extract some of the landscaping elements put it out as a separate portion of the job. So these are some construction things we learned internally about how to do project bidding and construction. Um, we also started seeing things in the, in the, the development community that weren't uh, uh, stormwater management practice related, um, just standard kind of housing development. Um, this looks like a typical you know, row house going in, um, but when you look, that actually was a green infrastructure practice. That was an infiltration uh, trench um, that almost got disemboweled here uh, through excavation that happened too close to the sidewalks. So our infrastructure was compromised. So we're learning you know, how development impacts can have effects. Um, this was a porous street, one of our early porous streets where uh, vacant property, uh, I'm sorry, residential property development um, you know, impacted based on sediment and truck traffic and, and damaged our street. Uh, we actually were not able to get as much performance out of the street as we originally hoped. These are all lessons learned in figuring out how to site uh, and design certain practices. That led to working with uh, uh, the Pennsylvania One Call and trying to figure out how do you capture uh, you know, different unique infrastructure like green infrastructure uh, you know, that's maybe not a linear asset, maybe it's more uh, a different shape when you think about the stuff that's happening subsurface. How do you actually document that uh, that makes sense to, to kind of the development uh, community? 
Um, and then working with city coordination, uh, plumbing ditches that happen, uh, streets repaving, uh, PICO and, and PGW uh, um, related investments, um, just making sure that, that our infrastructure is not compromised when, when all the other utilities are, are, are working in the same place. Um, moving into maintenance, uh, one of the most critical elements, if not the most critical element uh, of, of, of these investments um, is really building a maintenance program. Um, we can't, again, invest in our neighborhoods if we don't have the ability to maintain them uh, at the scale and the pace and, and the, the expectation that, that our communities uh, you know, expect. Um, just a graph in the growth of the program as the years have moved on. Um, we're in the, to the tune of over you know, 700, I think 800 projects uh, as of today. Uh, that need to be maintained. We do that by documenting in extreme detail, like any other asset that the water department invests in, um, every kind of bit of it, uh, where are the clean outs, where are the, the cuts, where, you know, what's the size of the trench, uh, documenting it in detail because we feed it into our work order management system like we do all other infrastructure. Uh, when it's in our work order management system, we can mobilize crews, we can take notes, we can figure out, you know, frequency and details and costs and you name it. Uh, we're able to actually manage these distributed assets the like we do inlets and pipes and sewers, uh, and hydrants, you know, throughout the, the entire city. Um, standard and, and protocols as well for, for maintenance side of things. Um, really understanding what's the frequency and what's the expectations for surface and subsurface maintenance. So just some glimpses into what our protocols are uh, for stormwater tree trenches and some rain gardens. Um, but really, again, standardizing and documenting how we want to maintain this infrastructure for the long haul. Um, the benefits of going out during wet. Everything may look great during dry weather, but does it function? These are stormwater management practices. So do they function in wet weather? Uh, what do we learn uh, when we go out during extreme weather events to see, you know, are these sites taking on water? Are they actually, you know, operating in the way that they were designed to? Um, maintenance elements and costs. I, I, you know, I like this slide. There's a lot on here, but, but really it's the the fact that, that green infrastructure is not universal, it's sometimes built on private, sometimes in public, sometimes on street, sometimes off street. Uh, we do maintenance, whether it's preventative maintenance or routine maintenance. Sometimes we have to do emergency repairs and retrofits if something happens. There's surface elements and subsurface elements. So kind of just giving a glimpse into all the different elements of a maintenance program. Well, how do we do that? Well, we have a diverse workforce in which to do it. Uh, you have arborists and horticulturists and some engineering firms, and we use civil service uh, labor as well. We work with special service districts and community groups. Um, but one I want, really want to highlight is Power Core, which I'll get into in, in uh, another slide. Um, but we have kind of contracted maintenance uh, and, and professional service maintenance and civil service workforce maintaining. But we also tap into uh, a volunteer based, the neighborhood based uh, adoption sites. So we do uh, adoption maintenance, which is some light, light uh, surface based maintenance with some community groups through small grants. Uh, awards to help maintain some of our sites. Um, but I mentioned this Power Core program. For those that aren't familiar, I really encourage uh, to look it into some more detail or we can connect you with the, the web resources. Um, but it's a program that takes at-risk youths between age 18 to 25 and gets them uh, an opportunity for uh, on-the-job training, uh, some education training, some professional uh, um, um, uh, uh, tutoring and coaching, um, and and gets them employed, and I know Parks and Rec and Streets Department and many others have, have employed the services of Power Corps through their cohorts. Um, we use them a lot for, for green infrastructure maintenance. And one of the best pieces about it is the, the jobs creation piece from it. I believe four of the five gentlemen on the, on the, left, uh, the left photo here all went through the Power Corps program. I'll have to verify that maybe all five of them actually. Um, but it, it has become kind of a, 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 an intern to kind of hire uh, based program. And, and now these folks uh, you know, have uh, civil service jobs, permanent civil service jobs here with the Philadelphia Water Department maintaining infrastructure. So we're seeing kind of green jobs and workforce development in action. Um, moving into monitoring, um, does it work, right? I mean, this is a program where we need to make sure it works, but why do we monitor? We don't just monitor for performance, that's key. We're also looking at ease of implementation and looking at different physical conditions to see if you know, cost effective, trying to see if we can be more efficient uh, and hopefully using monitoring to inform maintenance, just the importance of feedback loops, what you learn in the field, how that translates to how you influence planning and design, what you learn and what you need to do for uh, construction improvements. Um, and again, how, how what you're monitoring or, or maintaining, how it really affects uh, any kind of retrofits or increasing performance moving forward. 
So does it work? Yes, <laughs> these practices have, have worked. Um, they actually perform better than we predicted. They overflow less frequently. We're seeing higher infiltration rates and faster drain down times. We're seeing excess storage capacity. Um, it's just really you know, exciting to be able to see it. Um, how do we know that that's happening? Um, we do research as well. Uh, we had early on uh, uh, increasing uh, capture efficiency by modifying some inlets. So contracting uh, with Villanova University to do some uh, new inlet design uh, to make sure that we're actually getting as much flow from the street uh, into the off-street practices. Uh, so an example of an academic partnership. Um, we work with Drexel University to look at uh, low-cost sensor technology. What's really important when you have a distributed infrastructure like we do here, how do you get as many eyes on these practices as you can to understand how they're working and what they're doing? So fortunately, the technology is there with low cost sensors that we can distribute and install quite a few, sens quite a few sensors to really understand uh, how to grab data from these distributed sites with, with very little uh, in-field related efforts. So all this kind of leading into what have we accomplished? I know it took us a while to get there, 33 and a half minutes to get there. Um, but I love this slide for a variety of reasons. Um, it gives you a glimpse into our accomplishments as a city, uh, uh, as a region, uh, what we've been able to deliver. Um, you may be able to see, you know, if you do quick math here, that our regulations and our incentivized retrofits account for 75% of delivery of our, our green acres to date uh, through 10 years. Uh, and 25% or 505 acres uh, have been delivered through uh, uh, public retrofits on streets, parks, and, and other uh, public property. Um, what I like to show here is that uh, brown color, I guess, or um, is the combined sewerage section of the city. Um, but you can see our regulations and our incentivized retrofits actually occur outside of, of the combined sewerage section as well. So although we have 2,000 green acres in our combined sewerage system, we have over 500 acres. I didn't get a chance to update that number uh, in the separate, the municipal separate storm sewer section of the city as well. So Green City Clean Water is the combined sewer overflow program actually has elements that are that are Green City Clean Waters, the City of Philadelphia program as well. Oops, wrong one. Um, and I just want to clearly just show some, some photos of making dots a reality by kind of showing you. Oh, the other thing too, yeah, is, is investments in pretty much every single neighborhood in this city. Uh, you know, just the, these dots all represent practices, obviously, um, but you can see the, the spread throughout the entire city. Um, and just some, some photos, examples of streets, sidewalk planters, uh, subsurface trenches, um, uh, infiltration trench during mid-construction. Uh, here's some sites at a uh, um, uh, vacant property. Uh, the upper right-hand photo is the zoo parking lot. So these are all, uh, you know, rain gardens and and uh, 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 bio retention related areas on public facilities and, and vacant lands. Um, an example of a school for those that that see our schoolyards as you know vast areas of impervious cover. Uh, this is a project that went through Chester Arthur. It went through our incentives program. Uh, where Trust for Public Lands helped deliver uh, uh, green infrastructure and many other aspects, uh, play equipment, outdoor living, learning landscape type of activities at our schoolyards. Uh, Parks and Recreation is probably our most successful partnership to date, um, looking at Kemble Park and, and just, uh, just a variety of places here. You can see that we really have, have kind of integrated nature-based sustainable stormwater management practices into, into the park landscape. Um, so where are we? Um, I talked about this being a 25-year program. Here we are 10 years in. Um, we were on our way. June 1st was our 10-year uh, compliance deadline. Uh, we needed to deliver 2,148 acres. Um, and we all know what happened over the last year or so. Uh, COVID got us, got us all. Um, construction shutdowns, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, material-related uh, procurement issues, uh, really kind of set us uh, back a little bit. Well, we got an administrative extension working with our regulatory agencies um, to give us an extension to December of 2021. Um, I could say we're at almost 2,000 green acres now uh, with about 600 green acres in construction. Uh, so we are on our path to meeting our 10-year target, or you can call it a 10.5-year target, I guess, um, you know, uh, uh, by the end of December of this year. Um, we also have this, this evaluation and adaptation plan, which looks at what we've accomplished to date and starts to give a glimpse into, into any adaptations that need to take place in order for us to meet the out years of the program. So that's a key compliance document that's due in May as well. And as you can imagine, we have a lot of other responsibilities. The way I started that first slide here, um, being a, a one water utility, uh, we're actively negotiating the terms of a, 
a, a permit for the the forty percent of our city served by these separate sewers, that municipal separate storm sewer area. So here we are with additional regulatory requirements. Um, uh, um, you know, looking at the effects of climate change, we're all fresh off the heels of, of watching the destruction that Ida had caused and, and what the city's investments may need to be in order to, to mitigate the effects of, of extreme weather events. Um, and we all see in the news all the time, PFAS and, and other emerging contaminants. Um, so we're in a world of, of increasing regulatory responsibility uh, and also have aging infrastructure as a city. When you have 7,000 miles of, of pipe, water and sewer pipe, uh, replacing that at the, the scale that needs to happen uh, is another major investment by this city. So how do we think about the next 15 years of green city, clean waters while we balance the responsibilities we have in other sectors? We're really starting to get into integrated planning and thinking about how, what does integrated planning mean based on these new Clean Water Act uh, uh, amendments that happened in January of 2019 that really encourage water utilities to negotiate long-term programs that balance compliance, uh, you know, thinking about uh, all the programs that we see here, uh, all of our wet weather programs and other investments, not just the wastewater and the stormwater side, um, but how do we really think about the other investments you need to do for, for safe drinking water, uh, source water protection and climate resiliency. So I really, you know, the department is thinking about adaptation uh, in our out years, not just for the CSO program, but how do we really uh, continue down this path of what we started 20 years ago, which was about integrated planning, long-term watershed wide uh, 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 investment moving into the future. I'm gonna close out here with just some of the benefits. A lot of times folks talk about green infrastructure and the co-benefits they provide. I think one of my early slides talked about the multi-benefits of green infrastructure. There's a phrase called you know, triple bottom line or, or the economic environmental social benefits. People also say people, planet, profit. Well, those that know the water department, we're not in the profit business where we don't, we don't make money. Uh, you know, we collect rates so we can invest in infrastructure and in our communities uh, to bring about benefits. Uh, to water and, and wastewater and stormwater services. Um, so I changed that to product here. And when we embarked on green infrastructure, we had a lot of you know, research and data uh, trying to say, well, what are the benefits of, of distributed nature-based infrastructure? And I'm proud to say over the last 10 years, we've seen published studies uh, that actually are filling in those gaps for us. What we thought and hoped were gonna happen, we're actually seeing it through, through data and, and, and research uh, and journal articles. Um, some examples, public health and safety, studies on reduction in narcotics uh, near green infrastructure practices, crime reduction, 10% increase in, in urban canopy, uh, you know, correlated to a decrease in crime, mental health improvements, fewer prescriptions of, of antidepressants, less mental distress, uh, higher life satisfaction, uh, overall well-being uh, for, for folks that, that get to experience and see uh, nature-based infrastructure. Uh, benefits to academics, increase in test scores, positive relationships between nature exposure and student performance, uh, you know, increase in standardized test scores and graduation rates. So we're seeing, you know, research and, and studies, um, you know, bringing about what, what, you know, we all you know, thought and hoped when we, we started casting some of those assessments, you know, decades ago. Um, I end with this slide, and hopefully this brings us back to, to our mission statement uh, as a water department and, and as, uh, you know, service providers. Um, that red dot, again, is making sure we know our role uh, as, as a, a utility provider. We provide water, wastewater, and stormwater services. But we do also, again, uh, hopefully based on what you've seen us deliver uh, in this slide deck, um, that we think about not just about being a utility provider, but, but almost act as a water resource management firm for the region. Um, how do we think about flooding? Uh, what are we doing in our role in recreation and, and, and sustainable development? How we align with city and regional planning? Do we support industry and business growth? Uh, are we bringing improvements to waterways and ecosystems? Uh, are we working on land conservation? Um, so really just trying to bring home the fact that Green City Clean Waters is, yes, it's a program to help us mitigate combined sewer overflows, but hopefully the delivery approach that you've seen, the partners we've aligned with, the education programs, our investments, our commitment uh, to, to sustainable infrastructure and maintenance associated with it, uh, really show uh, that, that we are thinking about our water resources well into the future. I will end with that. Um, a lot of links for gathering more information. So thank you so much for the time. Glenn and I both uh, give our appreciation to the audience. And I think, Emma, we're going to turn it back to you for uh, some Q&A. Thanks, Mark and Glenn. Thank you both so much for, for sharing all of that with us. I know I'm excited, looking forward to our next 15 years 
of Green City Clean Waters. Um, and I'm sure everyone in the audience is as well. Um, just a quick reminder, anyone um, listening here, go ahead and post questions that you might have in the Q&A. We have a few more minutes here um, where our presenters will be available to us to answer any questions that you have live. Um, while we're waiting for anyone to pop any questions they have, um, I did have one question for you both. Um, one thing that really struck me about the presentation was the map that you showed towards the end mark um, that showed the progress of where you were. Um, it was a map of Philadelphia with a whole bunch of dots. Um, I was really impressed that you were able to reach so many different neighborhoods in Philadelphia. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to what has made you so successful in being able to reach so many different corners of the city. Glenn, do you want to handle that? I mean, I think uh, all the credit in the world to our outreach and, and education team. <laughs> so why don't you take that one, Glenn? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's been a, a real concerted effort to um, to identify opportunities and form partnerships all throughout the, the city. And we are we really are more and more um, taking equity as as a key principle and looking at, and, uh, at, at places where investments historically have not gone and realizing that we have an opportunity. Um, but, it, but again, um, you know, I, I alluded to a, a lot of the other large initiatives that the city is doing. And I think you know, the, the Kenya administration as a whole has really made equity a key priority and the rebuild initiative investing in parks and recreation centers and libraries and other city facilities um, is making investments all around the city, particularly in neighborhoods that haven't seen investment for quite a long time. And it, we have made a real effort to piggyback on that program and make investments in those same places. And so when where uh, parks and well, well, where a recreation center might be doing enhancements to a building, um, we we're working outside on the landscape and installing, um, you know, rain gardens or you know uh, maybe even some permeable pavement or, or you know. So we're really looking at uh, trying to leverage those investments. But it, it's something that, as I said, is really guiding our planning work at this stage. Thanks so much for that. Um, just want to give people one more minute for any last minute questions they might have. Mark or Glenn, do any of you have, do either of you have any, any closing thoughts, any kind of big picture, one lesson learned or one kind of, um, just little nugget that you want to leave people with? Um, the phrase, it takes a village to deliver kind of an ambitious program is probably an understatement, but you know, Glenn and I alluded to to just the partnerships that have formed, and you know, we probably didn't cover everyone that we should have. But you think about the academic community, the the nonprofit community, our environmental advocacy community, uh, working with the regulatory community, the development folks. Um, you know, obviously our residents and our ratepayers. Uh, you know, it just takes so many people to be part of, you know, um, modifying the urban fabric, right? I mean, we are changing the landscape and it's it's challenging to do. And, and you know, it's not all rosy, right? You got, you know, you got a presentation here of, you know, some of our successes, but it, you know, it's hard, right? I mean, it, it, it really does, uh, you know, take a, a lot of folks kind of aligning for, for kind of this purpose uh, to really kind of change the way we build our cities and, and how uh, we can incorporate natural landscape back into, into cities, hundreds of year old cities. So, uh, just a million thanks to to the, the community of practice here, um, you know, for their part in, in making this happen. Glenn and I are, you know, we get to share this message by way of slide deck, uh, but there's hundreds and thousands of people in the city that have helped deliver uh, the contents of it. So thank you to all. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, I'm seeing a few questions come in here through the Q&A, um, so I'll pose these questions to you both. Um, the first question comes from Robin. I'm so impressed with the jobs for at-risk youth. Any opportunities for out of Philly franchises to start? I'm I'm really happy that question came up. I know Camden uh, has really embraced the the, the Power Core uh, program as well, and they've they've replicated the model uh, that was established here, and it's been wildly successful. Um, we actually have a contingent coming in from Boston 
uh, they're trying to create a Boston Conservation Corps. Uh, they've been working with Power Corps, Julie Halengas, uh, to kind of model uh, a program that they want to start there. So we actually have a couple city council folks from Boston coming in. Uh, when is that, Glenn? Next Thursday and Friday, they're going to be in town. Um, and we're going we're gonna to meet the Power Corps cohorts and, and the leadership team at Power Corps and bring them to some sites that, uh, that the members uh, help us maintain. So um, we, we have seen growth in that program or programs similar to it. Uh, we've been able to, to connect it as a case study into some U.S. Water Alliance publications. So it's getting the message is getting out there uh, through case study and, and, and broadcasting some of the successes. Um, but it is a phenomenal story. And it probably warrants its own hours of, of presentation as well. Um, but please get a chance to, to take, you know, take a look at Power Core PHL uh, and, and, and get to see the amazing work that they've been doing. Thanks, Mark. Um, one more question came in from Karen. How much permeable street paving did you do? And what does the maintenance on that look like? Um, I can get back to you on statistics, uh, number of blocks, number of green acres. Um, uh, porous streets um, is an extremely challenging, uh, is challenging for us. I think that one of the biggest lessons learned is we may not do a lot of porous streets, uh, that the practice is probably much better for porous parking lots. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of the, 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 um, the you know, the maintenance uh, itself is doable, but we don't have alternate side of the street parking in the city. Uh, you know, parking is at a premium. Trying to get people off the blocks uh, that you need to maintain um, is a bit of a challenge, uh, amongst other things. Uh, you know, there's just so much action happening in our streets. We may think that the, the street is perfect for poorer street, put it down. Uh, and then you find out later on that, you know, a plumbing ditch came in and just tore into a big section of it that, that, that surprised you. Um, how you repair that street. Uh, you know, so they've been a little bit challenging. Uh, we're not giving up on them, um, but I will say we want to master the practice quite a bit more in, uh, you know, more parking lot facilities um, where we think the, the, the longevity uh, is quite a bit better off than maybe the, the public right away. Um, but I can get you some statistics of what's out there uh, if someone wants to follow back up with me. Um, I, don't tech, I don't know them offhand. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Mark and Glenn. Uh, I'm afraid it's time to wrap up our session, but just again, I wanna thank Glenn and Mark for taking the time to share their knowledge and expertise about uh, Green City Clean Waters with us um, during this week of Watershed Congress presentations. And have a good afternoon.